It's the 26th of September, 2015, and this is episode 250. This show is intended for informational and educational purposes only. What cryptocurrency enables is new, empowering, and exciting, but we're not experts. Just obsessed companions walking the road towards a more peer-to-peer future. On today's episode of Let's Talk Bitcoin, we're in New York City for the recent Blockstack Summit, a one-day technical event at NYU for developers of decentralized applications. Today, we're listening in on the questions and answers panel, which was moderated by Princeton professor J.P. Singh, featuring, and I apologize for pronunciation on these names in advance, Albert Wanger, partner at USV, Jalak Joman Putra, founder at Future Slash Perfect Ventures, Naval Ravikant, co-founder of AngelList, and William Mogayar, founder of Startup Management. The audio starts with Albert Wanger answering the question, quote, how did you get interested in blockchain technology? Enjoy the show. I have two parts to my answer. The first part is that as human square ventures, we have invested a lot in businesses on the basis of them having network effects. So um, that's obvious in something like Twitter, where you follow other people, um, maybe somewhat obvious in a marketplace like Etsy, and maybe somewhat less obvious uh, in things like uh, DuckDuckGo. Um, but underlying all of those are a certain type of network effect, where as more people use the system, the system actually becomes more useful for everybody who's already using it. And so one of the questions we ask ourselves a lot is, what will... Um, help undermine network effects in the future because they're great from an investor's perspective, um, but when network effects are very strong, they also result in a great concentration of power. Um, So from a social perspective, they're maybe not as desirable. And we believe that blockchain, and I'm sure we'll come back to this topic several times, blockchain is the technology that can help undermine the network effects of the very large uh, network players. And then there's a separate reason for why I'm excited about this because I did study computer science. Um, I did, um, you know, learn way back about two-phase commit and the early struggles we had with making anything work that wasn't like on one little thing uh, centrally controlled. And if you think of the way I always describe the blockchain to people who uh, really don't know what it is, is I draw a two by two matrix, and and one axis is where the data is logically centralized or decentralized, so single view or many different versions that diverge. And then whether this is organizationally controlled by a single organization or not by a single organization. And when it, once I realized that there was now a technology that made an entire quadrant accessible that wasn't previously accessible, which is the logically centralized organization of decentralized quadrant that simply did not exist, that's what I got very excited. Well, what got you yeah, most uh, excited about it? Hopefully you actually hear me. Uh, I am excited about the blockchain for very similar philosophical reasons to what uh, Albert and the others laid out. But uh, I would say even more so to me, uh, I grew up in the age of the internet, when the internet was coming of age in the mid-90s. And it was this incredible promise of this force for human freedom. And I was as disappointed as everyone else to watch the internet be taken over in succession by Microsoft and Netscape and America Online and Facebook and Twitter and all kinds of ball gardens, which are beautiful things for investors, but I think they're bad things for freedom. Uh, you know, you have the Great Firewall of China, you have censorship, you have uh, governments and ISPs controlling what we can and cannot see and can and cannot do. And the solution to this, for the internet of developers will promise, is to decentralize all the things. Decentralize everything. <laughs> Because it gives us the ability to decentralize everything. Uh, and as Adam pointed out, there is this thing called network effects, which exists around marketplaces and exchanges and coordination, which will always exist and will always create some power towards centralization. But I'm excited to support any effort that makes every piece of software open source and every uh, central actor the decentralized entity. That's why I'm, I'm, I'm glad to be an investor in one day and I'm glad to be an investor in IPFS and forms work. Uh, and I did those, frankly. Still never know. But mainly for political reasons. <laughs> so I don't know about you all, but what I know about and feel through both Albert and Naval 
is that investors are bad for freedom. So. <laughs> um, okay, so I, um, my next couple of questions. So I, I live in two worlds. I'm a, you don't know me, but I'm a professor of computer science at Princeton, um, and I'm also an entrepreneur, so I build companies. And as a professor, we believe in the power of ideas, interesting ideas. We don't really care about it. Real or not, right? Um, as an entrepreneur, you care about making things real and making them impactful. So, with that in mind, um, the question for you two questions. The first one is Can you give examples of applications, one that you think is going to become real on blockchain? It's sort of a near, a near certainty to become real and powerful in blockchain in the near term. And another that may or may not ever become real, but you think it's really interesting. So, if Great. I, I get the tough one. No, 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 no. I'm happy to. Um, yeah, well, we're, um, we were talking about this a little bit before, and in terms of, I, I really look at the world, and right now, I mean, yes, we want to get to a decentralized future, and yeah, I mean, we're all in it for the same reasons, I think, that, you know, Naval laid out, uh, but there's some practicalities to, to getting there, which is one of the reasons we're, we're all in this room. And um, uh, one of my investments is, is in BitPesa. Um, and one of the things that was interesting to me there was that, um, again, we're looking at um, a country, a continent that does not have um, financial systems or, or the ones that are in place are, are, can be very corrupt and, and individuals have to pay a lot to be part of it. They're paying a huge tax to be a part of it. And, um, the, the technology is being used right now to allow um, uh, to allow folks to transact in, in much uh, uh, with, with a lot less fees. So that that's I mean that's a currency you know, um, transfer uh, of currency right now that I see is happening. Um, it, you know it's not happening here in the developed world because we already have legacy infrastructure that's going to take a lot more time to disintermediate. Um, and longer term, what I really want to see is this whole idea, what I alluded to um, earlier, which is this idea of this um, portable uh, uh, digital identity that people own. Uh, and, uh, and that is why I, I'm investing in it. I think we need to um, invest in shorter term applications to get to that longer term goal and, and, and figure out the interoperability issues, which we're all here talking about too. Um, but but that's eventually you know what I want to see happen in my lifetime. Yeah. I want to definitely double down on that in the sense that I think identity is the central linchpin to enabling a large number of different systems that everybody's working on, and whether that's one name uh, or somebody else, it's sort of or some combination of multiple different systems. But it, it seems central if we want to, as Naval said, decentralize all things. You can't sort of say, hey, it's all decentralized, but you're going to go log in with Facebook. I mean, it just makes no sense. So it is the central linchpin for lots and lots of systems. And, and I am very much in the camp of people who believe that very few things should be anonymous. There's some people who believe that everything should be, could be, has to be anonymous. I think identity is central to lots of human relations, group relations. Uh, lots of human endeavors and efforts are only possible because we know each other's identity, respect each other, um, know what we've done for each other, how we've helped each other, how we will continue to help each other. So identity is central, and if we're going to fail at identity, I think we will fail at everything else in this decentralized all things world. Yeah, I mean, since we're on the topic of identity, I, I think I want to take a middle ground approach here. Uh, I think identity on its own uh, is not going to cut it. Identity has to come with applications that make sense. Uh, so I think, as much as I, I would love identity to be very decentralized and, and be a linchpin, I think it's going to be a little bit difficult. Uh, so it's just, just a challenge that I would put out there. Uh, whoever is in the space, I think, has to not just uh, work on the protocols, but also work and attach applications to, to the identity part to make that happen. And since we talked about remittances, it's, it's obviously if everybody talks, oh yeah, this billion dollar or multi-billion dollar 
uh, market the businesses uh, and the Western Union and everybody else is skimming a lot of percentages from it. I think it's going to continue to be a very fragmented uh, marketplace. I don't think one company is going to own the businesses. Uh, I think at the end of the day, uh, we haven't seen yet the power of what wallets can do. Uh, decentralized wallet. I think we're still in the first phase of wallets, and I'm waiting to see a second generation of wallets that can really, really empower us, the individuals, because we talk about freedom. I mean, we can be our own bank. I'm not, I'm not talking about replacing the banks. I'm talking about having an alternative to the banks. I think that whether it's a Bitcoin wallet or I'm going to call it a cryptocurrency wallet, because I don't think Bitcoin on its own on its own is, is going to be the killer thing here. What we have is a new network. And the network, I've said that before, the network may be more important than the money, than the, than the Bitcoin in the network, which means that we have this new overlay uh, network. For the first time, we have a, a network that's public, that is global, and that is not owned by the banks. If you talk to a bank, they'll say, oh yeah, we have SWIFT and we have other, other uh, networks between the banks, and they are global and they can move money fast. But Bitcoin as a network is, is important as a public network uh, because it's not ju just going to enable Bitcoins to move on it. I'm waiting to see any currency move on the Bitcoin network or any public blockchain network, and I think that's going to be important. Yeah, I would say if we're looking for Bitcoin and blockchain adoption, uh, one interesting thing to consider is uh, machine-to-machine -machine communications, computers communicating with computers. Uh, the thought exercise that I can use is if, if there wasn't AI, artificial intelligence, which I know we're a long ways from, that's a whole separate discussion. But if there wasn't AI, then AI would not bother signing up for a Visa or a MasterCard or opening a bank account in Wells Fargo. And AI would communicate and exchange and transact using the blockchain and using Bitcoin. That would be its native currency, its native language. So I think whenever you have machines communicating with machines, there is a greater propensity, a greater advantage to using something like Bitcoin or blockchain to decentralize than by using an existing central ledger or an existing settlement mechanism. So I think this of the, you know, every new technology first starts out not by disrupting the incumbents or replacing the way things are done to the day, but by creating and addressing some new need uh, that just wasn't addressable before. So I think the same way Bitcoin and blockchain will solve problems that machines have, perhaps microtransactions, uh, perhaps uh, value exchange to be code, uh, that just cannot be solved today. Uh, you know, if you're a 17 year old Romanian hacker and you're writing the next great thing and it has to have some component of exchanging money in there, they're not going to go to the bank and open an account and try to figure out how to wire money internationally, they're just going to code Bitcoin. In. Same way, if a server and, uh, and a, a browser are arguing, is a denial of service attack or is a traffic should have sent you packet, the easiest way to settle that debate is by Bitcoin. If they're a uh, self driving car and they're trying to figure out who gets priority on the road, the easiest way to settle that argument is the net is using some kind of a lightning network on top of Bitcoin. Uh, it's not to send a visa transaction. So, I, I am actually very interested in seeing the applications that are only uniquely possible because of Bitcoin. There's just no way to do them currently, uh, and they probably require machines to communicate with each other at very, very fast speeds and at very, very small amounts. Uh, but you know, that's a sheer guess. I think nobody really knows we're all waiting for the killer app to come along already. And maybe to um, add to that just a little more, I, I think. In general, we should all be looking for use cases where whatever you're building is not displacing something on a it is better, faster, cheaper type displacement. Because this is a disruptive technology, and disruptive technologies come into the market in areas where there's no existing solution, as opposed to where you're displacing something. Which is why I'm generally quite skeptical of a lot of payments use cases of this technology. Um, Maybe in certain geographies where payment is fundamentally broken, but not in geographies where payment is sort of working. You may not like how it works, but it's sort of working. Um, and so uh, I think you know, paying for code to execute, uh, if you think about code execution, you can execute anywhere in the world, so you don't know which currency might be relevant. That's a great example of something where this has a distinct advantage. Um, 
And th those are the kind of things we should be looking for, things that um, simply are not solved as opposed to things that are solved in a way that we don't like. Um, and, and this is, coming back to identity, one of the issues with identity is there are existing identity systems and they work quite well. So what we have to think about is, what is a use case of identity where the existing identity systems fail badly? And those are the ones we should be working on. So I have a question. Um, what is the use case for identity that um, <laughs> there isn't a solution for it? Um, uh, that's a great question. I, I, I'll give you one example of where I think existing identity is fundamentally broken. Um, is um, attribution on uh, publishing, for instance, right? Because if you attribute to a Twitter account, your Twitter account can get suspended, revoked. If you attribute to a Facebook account, your Facebook account can be uh, revoked. So if you're publishing things where you have any expectation that it might get revoked, this is a kind of use case where this type of identity is superior. Um, and superior in a way that's not better, cheaper, faster, but superior in a fundamentally different, cannot be revoked by a third party. So to some extent, we're all drinking the Kool-Aid um, in terms of this is water, just to highly <laughs> dilute the Kool Aid. Um, it's, um, um, it's you know identity. It's all these applications. Let's talk about why this all like failed. Um, are there real barriers? Real hurdles here? Is this going to happen? You think, or why might this fail? Well, I think. Um Going back to what Albert just said about use cases, um, you know, if we continue to uh, just kind of experiment in labs and not take the technology out there and provide use cases um, a, a value, then uh, then this won't go anywhere. I mean, I, I think you know we've all drank the Kool Aid in this room, and it's it's about how does the rest of the world drink the Kool Aid and see the value, and it is so disruptive. It is so different from the way people are used to thinking about the world. It's very obvious to all of us. Um, but when I, you know, when I'm out there and talking to even other investors, right, they they, um, they they don't see the value. They think things are fine the way they are. They're not seeing it how this can be used, you know, down the road in, in applications we don't even see. So I, I think that that is a big risk. I think interoperability is, is going to be absolutely key um, and figuring out how these different um, you know, blockchains uh, will inter, interoperate and, and work together to, to create a more seamless uh, platform. So, um, so th those are uh, you know, the challenges um, on, on you know, why this won't uh, get, get adoption. Part of this is we can also speak to, specific, as we've done, the, the specific things that one of these uh, wonderful companies out here should do and should focus on in order to overcome that and to make sure it all happens. Yeah, I mean, I think we will fail if uh, developers do not do a good job at explaining the context uh, upon which they are developing and working on whatever they're working on. Because everything fits within something else. And uh, we are kind of in a blurring phase right now because everything that was talked about this morning is really into three different buckets, the way I see it. There is the base layer protocols, and there is a lot of middleware, which is block stack is really primarily involved in. And then there's the application layer. And then we're talking about all of these three at the same time, and none of them are mature enough. And it's kind of difficult to write applications when the middleware is not mature, or the protocol is still being developed. So that is a challenge. So it puts more pressure on you, the developers, to explain as much as possible uh, why we're doing this and what is the real world benefit, advantage, difference uh, in, in doing what, we, what, what you're doing, basically. Uh, I, I put these failure modes in kind of a couple of different buckets. Um, I do think there are some fundamental technological failure modes. It could turn out that some of the systems we're currently building on have flaws that we don't yet know that will get uncovered. Um, uh, there's also the possibility that we make some progress on quantum computing, which won't throw out hashing, but will throw out some of the uh, key generation, so there's always that possibility. Um, then there, the next bucket in my mind are things that are related to um, our expectations of time horizon. So uh, I think, I personally think this is very, very early days, and I think that um, one failure mode for individual efforts is that they just run out of steam and time or money. 
Um, and I think that's one that everybody should be aware of. Uh, I certainly have lost money many times by thinking that things were going to happen faster than they actually happened. Definitely many more times than I've lost money by investing in something um, that, that happened faster than I thought it would. So, um, so I think there's a big failure mode around just we all think this is happening overnight, whereas I think in reality it's going to happen at a much, much smaller pace. And so just pacing ourselves. And then I think the third set of failure modes um, is the empire striking back, right? Which is centralization is a very powerful economic and um, uh, political force. And it's a powerful force because it makes people rich and because it gives people control. <coughs> And so we should um, not be blind to um, the various reactions that we will encounter. So there's a whole other set of challenges that arises from centralization being quite so powerful. And one of the reasons it is powerful has to do with fundamental properties of information. And I won't bore you with the sort of technicality of what something is. But there's a production function that's called supermodular, and you can go look that up. But the simple explanation is that having more information is almost always better um, for the person having it. Because you can kind of, the simple explanation is you can always ignore it. So on the margin, it adds something to what you have. And that's why companies such as Google and Facebook, etc., turn into these information hogs, just because they already have information. And so the incremental information is more valuable in some ways to them than it is to anybody else. So we should not kid ourselves that those forces can be easily overcome. I thought Naval thought this, there was no chance of failure, so he ran away, but he's back. So, um... <laughs> yeah. Sorry about dropping in that. Uh, you know, on the challenges side, I, I think Albert had a really good summary. I would just re-emphasize for those of you who are doing funded startups that number two is a big one. Most of you were too early, not too late, and most of you have been rather cash before whatever your vision is, is ready to be absorbed by the market and materializes. So this is a game of survivor. The longer you can last, the cheaper you can be, the more you can scrape by, the more likely you're going to be able to make your own timing here. Um, so it is really, really important to survive and to find near-term applications that will get you funded, bring money in the door, and very important to keep your burn rate low. And, and that is, I think, the challenge. The challenge is, uh, you know, are we going to be a generation of open source hackers that leave behind code for the next generation to use? Or are we actually going to be the entrepreneurs that manage to build the business and applications that get adopted? So we have to keep a very, very keen eye on where this is actually being adopted. Uh, as people have mentioned before, uh, what identity problems can be solved that just aren't solved for today? And I'll throw one in the ring. I think, uh, I think uh, credible anonymity is a hard problem. Today on the web, uh, you can be anonymous. Um, or you can be known. Uh, but it's very hard to be the same entity that is anonymous but credible over time to build a reputation uh, that then becomes powerful and important and a voice that's worth hearing but still not truly knowing who they are. Uh, and to, to my knowledge, there are very few individuals who manage to do this, but Satoshi Nakamoto is one of them. Uh, Satoshi Nakamoto is credible. Satoshi can, can speak with the Satoshi key, and we know that Satoshi, yet we don't know who Satoshi is. And I think there are a lot more people in the world who would like to have that kind of identity uh, because it might help save their life if they're living in the wrong regime or they're, they're covered by the wrong, the wrong laws. So that's an example of an identity problem uh, that we can solve uh, using a blockchain uh, that we cannot solve today using any centralized infrastructure because the stakes are too high. But there are probably better commercial identity problems to solve. So I think the biggest challenge for all of you in this room is just figuring out how to survive as credible companies while still not letting go of the vision of the opportunity, knowing that it might take 10 or 15 years to materialize. This could be a very, very long game. So that was very well put. Um, some of us are just striving for credibility and without anonymity. Um, but, uh, <laughs> um, but that was very well put. Um, I've been given very strong signals from John there that my questions are terrible, so we should, uh, we should move on to questions from the audience. Um, so, anybody with questions, please come up to the mic where John is standing, um, and that's the first in, first out of all of the views for questions. Yes, you all fight over the mic, so we have time for about four questions. So. Right, you got your first. So, we're in a room full of engineers. 
and engineers are famous for solving technical problems, but not building products that solve people's problems. What can all of us as engineers do to focus on using the technology to build products that solve real problems um, instead of just focusing on data the lower protocol level? Talk to more people that are not uh, engineers. Uh, like we just did you and I, like half an hour ago, we had a good conversation. Uh, and that, that's what I, what I focus on. I'm not, a, I'm not a technical person, but I kind of keep scratching my head trying to understand what you are all, what all of you are doing and trying to explain it to others in English, basically. And that, that's, that's been my, my mission. Um, so talk to more people and, and, uh, and don't be too hung up on perfection. Uh, there are low-hanging fruit use cases, and I will disagree a little bit with Albert as far as, like, not everything has to be disruptive, not everything has to be very difficult. You don't have to jump very high right away. I think there is low-hanging fruit and that we can learn. Use that as a learning step. I mean, don't disregard disruption. Disruption takes sometimes a little bit longer, sometimes it's more difficult. But we can learn a lot by doing things cheaper, better, uh, with some improvements. Uh, so that then we can disrupt. That's how the internet started. We, we did we started by, by copying things uh, for, for a few years, and, and then suddenly we started to innovate a, a little bit more uh, vigorously. Anybody else have a perspective they want to share? Disagree on the history of the internet on that one. But <laughs> application-wise, application-wise, I mean, what, what, what happened between 95 and 98 that was really mind-boggling? Or even 99, 2000. I think the good stuff started to happen after the crash. More or less. I want to be sensitive to the person who's not physically here. Do you have any perspective on this? Yeah, it, you know, it's, a, it's a very tough one. Uh, there's two diametrically opposed schools of thought. Uh, one is that you should survey customers, listen diligently to them, and solve problems, their problems. And the other one is to solve your own problems because that will give you the best intuition for what the product should do. And then eventually, uh, your problem will scale to be everybody else's problem. Because whatever the geeks are doing today, everybody else is doing 10 years from now. Um, so there are two diametrically opposed schools of thought on this. And I think the first school of thought applies more towards enterprise software. So if you're trying to figure out how Wall Street works, and what problems they need to solve. You have to go interview them, sit with them, work with them, absorb what they do, and put your engineering hat aside. On the other hand, if you're trying to build a consumer product that's targeted at your mom, or your girlfriend, or your friend, or your brother, or, or whatever, or your husband, then you need to actually solve the problem more for yourself, because they're more like you than not. Um, so I think that the answer is different whether you're going for a consumer answer or an enterprise answer. But it's just really difficult. This is really what separates the winning companies from the losing companies. The winning companies, the founder is not just an engineer. They have that mythical, mystical quote unquote product sense. And that's why we, you know, lionize people like Steve Jobs and Mark Zuckerberg, not for their coding skills. As far as I understand, Steve Jobs was a very bad engineer and very briefly. Uh, and even Zach was, you know, I don't think they did the to close of eyes. Um, but they had a great product sense, and it is this magical, mystical, mythical thing that that nobody knows how to replicate. <laughs> but if you find someone who you think has good product sense, pull them as close to you as possible. Great. Next question. Um, yeah. So we're in an age of like uh, rapid innovation across different technologies that all dual use. They can be used for like great things, unlocking huge economic value, innovation, but also used for like terrorist financing or uh, where does Bitcoin and currency applications fit on the kind of very dangerous technology spectrum? And does anyone think that that's a failure mode for this technology? Well, I, I think anything disruptive can be used uh, uh, for bad or, or good. Um, and I'm actually very happy that um, Mt. Gox happens. I mean, I could have been happier than that happened just because I think you know it was it was bound to happen and to get it out of the way and and kind of like start really thinking about what what were the flaws you know why did that happen and how um, how can we start uh, uh, counteracting that and, and creating uh, you know more companies that are 
uh, doing things uh, uh, with, with you know, better intentions in mind. And, and so, I mean, look, we have a dark web. The dark web isn't going away. I, human nature, you know, there are always bad seeds in human nature. So I, um, I'm actually, you know, ironically think that uh, this kind of uh, adoption or interest from the financial industry in just the last few months, um, the last six months has been very positive overall for the industry. Uh, whether or not you agree with, or that that's not you know what where you want to see the use case, I think it's legitimized uh, the potential of um, and, and the elements that that um, that make it so unique and, and brought that to light with a broader uh, range of folks and and that's ultimately how we're going to get adoption across different industries and you know folks from the media industry now asking me you know how can we how can we start utilizing this where before it was just you know, a very negative kind of uh, out there concept for them. Anybody have a different thing? I want to say something very quickly about who could screw it up. The banks could screw it up for all of you, uh, but they could also help you, so we'll work with them. Uh, it's very, very tricky. Half of them will want to screw it up, and the other half will not. So what's important is for you to figure out which is the right half. <laughs> I think the failure mode is not necessarily the existence of nefarious activity. I think it, it goes on using different technologies. I do think the possible failure mode is uh, pointing at that as a reason for why things should be regulated in a way that imposes the kind of limitation that we're trying to overcome, right? So that imposes geographical boundaries, that imposes uh, certain um, transaction checking requirements that we're trying to get away from meaning checked by existing centralized institutions as opposed to checked by networks. So I think that is a potential failure mode. Um, and it's a failure mode not just, I think, for Bitcoin, but for the internet at large. Uh, and so I think we need to be very aware of that. People will use, they will point to child pornography to explain why the UK needs a um, you know, great firewall of the UK, and, and that is the problem, I think, that we all need to battle, not just in the context of Bitcoin, but in the much larger context of the internet. Now, well, I'm sorry, since you're not here, you don't get to answer this question. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> I'm going to answer this one. <laughs> uh, I'll take the contrary point of view. I think there might be technical... <laughs> <laughs> could, you, could you repeat and, that? And, and that, yeah, that would be bad across the board. I, I do. I not think there is a true failure mode for the technology. I think that all you can do is you can drive it underground. And if you look at BitTorrent, uh, if you look at Tor, uh, I mean, there are many governments that would like to see those things not exist, but yet they exist. You cannot turn off the internet. You can't turn off the internet now any more than you can turn off electricity or you can turn off, turn off plumbing. Uh, and because you cannot turn off the internet and you can't turn off open source code, you can't turn off decentralization. So you can chase it, you can hound it, you can regulate against it, but I think it wins at the end. We have water here and Kool-Aid in the Mal's house. No, I, 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 I agree in the long term entirely. I, I just think that this could be a much more drawn out fight than we would like. Um, yeah, they've never reflected in, in first world countries for decades. Uh, but in the end, you know, look, in the long of the timeline, technology is a trust in part of it. On the long of the timeline, you can see the attention to nuclear weapons in your home. A long enough timeline, little Johnny might create a singularity as part of the business start in his backyard. And so technology always has the potential to destroy it, but it also is the only thing that has the potential to knit us closer together and to advance us and to raise us out of the dirt. So you just can't turn back that clock. And I think within our lifetimes, so it might be a long time, but we will see huge innovations and effects coming out of blockchain technology, despite the well-intentioned efforts of people to protect us from technology. This episode of Let's Talk Bitcoin is brought to you by Tokenly. After nearly a year of development, three months of closed alpha, and during that time over a thousand swaps through the vending machine system, we're ready to push and are looking for the right salesman to join the team and help us introduce our tools and solutions to the people and projects who can make best use of them. If that sounds like you, email careers at tokenly.com to start the conversation. The LTB network, LTBN, formerly known as Let's Talk Bitcoin.com, has changed its name and promoted several key people to management positions. 
LTBN is adding the positions as part of an expansion, redesign, and official relaunch of the network website on October 1st. The new site will be the ltbnetwork.com, although Let's Talk Bitcoin.com will still redirect for the time being. Stephen Levine continues as CEO slash CFO. David R. Allen has been appointed publisher and general manager. Cheryl Holsapple is taking over for me as editor in chief. Jeff Benny is responsible for media development, and Denise Levine oversees internal communications. Founder Adam B. Levine, creator of the Let's Talk Bitcoin podcast, founder of the network, and CEO of Tokenly.com, announced the appointments today. He said, quote, I am very pleased to have had David, Cheryl, and most recently Jeff working with me over the past year. I'm confident in their abilities to meet the challenges going forward. As we've expanded the scope, a natural evolution has been to bring the team into direct management of the network with its redesign and expansion on the token-controlled platform. These appointments allow me to continue to focus on my twice-weekly Let's Talk Bitcoin podcast, along with the other hosts Andreas Antonopoulos and Stephanie Murphy, as well as oversee Tokenly.com's ongoing development. These are exciting times indeed. The LTB Network is a publishing platform built on token control access technology developed by the team at Tokenly.com and created for content providers to present the ideas and people involved with cryptocurrency through podcasts, articles, and discussion forums. Participation in the network is rewarded with LTB Coin, the official token of the network. The LTB network is operated by Completely Compostable Inc., a California-based C-corporation participating in various projects focused on creating and understanding the new possibilities enabled by cryptocurrency. For more information, contact publisher and general manager David R. Allen at uh, david.r.allen at theltbnetwork.com, or you can call him at area code 604-740-2510. End quote. So this is the first of a couple of announcements and changes I'll be sharing with you between now and the end of the year. Uh, Once again, thank you very much for your time and uh, for listening to me talk about this stuff as opposed to listening to the music that we've been listening to recently. The magic word for this episode of Let's Talk Bitcoin is LTBN. That's LTBN. You've got until the 3rd of October to visit letstalkbitcoin.com or the Let's Talk Bitcoin iOS app to enter it for your share of the listener rewards. Thanks for your time. Let's rejoin the panel now. It's sort of a recognition of having been around the internet from since, you know, 95. And, and we just always think these things go faster than they actually do. Um, so there's anything, one particular thing to point to, just rather the history of these types of innovations that just take a longer time than we would like them to. But everybody here is an investor, so everybody has a perspective on this, I think. Yeah, and I, I would just yeah. uh, think about adoption. Um, and. You know, while while we're in the thick of, of the community and the technology, we it's everything's obvious to us, right? On on um, how useful it can be, but people people and companies are very slow to adopt and change processes, even if, even if they see the value. Um, and and so um, there's you know infrastructure questions, but then it's how how quickly can you get people to uh, see the value of something that's that's so different, and, and it's a different way of looking at the world, and and so it's just I'd say more kind of the, you know maybe quicker than the internet was because you know we're that much more familiar with technology, but it is a whole different way of thinking about um, the way things are done. Yeah, I, I, I would say the, the, the reason why I think it's going to take 10, 15 years. First of all, it's just the generic answer. This is a network effect kind of uh, situation we're dealing with, network effect product. And that means that it's non-linear in nature. And humans are linear thinkers. So we literally extrapolate out um, everything in life, which what's probably going to happen here. This will, that's why it's generically true that most technology think longer to adopt and expect. But so then when it happens, it's bigger than thought because it's a curve rather than a straight line. So just generically, that, that prediction is true for most technologies. So that's one reason. That's, Second is, I think Bitcoin and blockchain are still waiting for the killer app. Uh, and what will happen is, until that killer app emerges, there's no need for hundreds of millions of people to be using it. But the moment a single killer app emerges, it will enable all the other apps, because hundreds of millions of people will adopt it for the basic app, and then all the other apps can ride along. It's sort of like the iPhone had to be out there before the app store could be out there. So I think there'll be sort of a non-linearity tipping point of the adoption, and I don't yet see what that application is the tipping point. And lastly, I think new concepts, the more new they are, the more foreign they are, the longer they take to percolate just through human networks, through human brains. Uh, and the 
the general rule of thumb is that, that kids start doing things first. And once kids figure out how to do something, uh, then when they grow up, you know, they sort of spread it to everybody else, because it's very natural for them. And the problem is kids are poor, kids don't have money, kids are under bank or not bank. So especially when you're dealing with something whose main adoption vector is a financial instrument, uh, you're dealing with the most conservative member of society. Like I always laugh when I see stuff like NASDAQ using blockchain. I know they're just fooling around, they're not serious, you know. The NASDAQ is never that no old ossified financial institution is ever going to drive the mass adoption of a new thing, right? Uh, so if we're counting on the NASDAQ to be an early adopter, and this is the wrong strategy for the kids. And the kids have to have a chance to get some money and grow up. I have no doubt that my, for, my, for my kid, Bitcoin and blockchain will be second nature. Um, I'm sure all of us at some point uh, you know, sat around in economics class and had to learn how federal open market operations work. And I'm sure nobody in this room remembers it unless it's their job. And yet we go ahead and we use money because we just trust this piece of paper. It's like oxygen. We just grew up with it. So right now, people don't have Bitcoin, don't have blockchain because they didn't grow up with it. Or I think we'll grow up with it. To them, Bitcoin and blockchain will have been around just as long as gold has for all practical purposes. Uh, so they won't have any of the fear that we have associated with it. They won't have any of the adoption characteristics where we're just uh, averse to this brand new. So I, I think it will take 10 or 15 years. That doesn't mean you can't build a business or make it work, just in the meantime. Uh, uh, Albert, you know, talked about being around the web since 95, out there since 95, 94. I remember the first bubble, the first crash. Um, you know, even though in 1999 there were a lot of companies that were funded, a lot of companies that didn't make it, there were still a lot of fortunes that were made. There were still a lot of great companies that got built. Um, so you can still be individually successful, even though for the state, you can go truly mass market might take 10 or 15 years. So what they're really saying is use your initial investment dollars, actually their investment dollars, to buy a really spacious, nice car. Yeah. <laughs> 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 All right, and we are out of time for questions from the audience. Okay, so let's, um, if anyone has some final remarks, final remarks um, to make, and then we'll move uh, Arguably, the bubble of Bitcoin has already happened. It was the people who had the original Bitcoin. So, um, so I think the uh, long process post bubble is actually what we're in, and we're sort of maybe in Bitcoin at some level um, where we were in two thousand one with the internet. So, if you hung around in two thousand one, and you actually managed to hang on until two thousand four, two thousand five, you did phenomenally well. And I think that's kind of in my mind where we are today on Bitcoin. I think that's true, really, from a currency perspective. But I think there's another bubble coming. Uh, I think there's two two types of people going that are doing stuff right now. There's the scrappy people that all of you here in this room. And I think I'm seeing a wave of uh, uh, other types of companies that are that are overfunding themselves and trying to shoot for the moon. And some of those will, will crash in a, in, a, in a year or two perhaps. So we, we might see another little kind of overshooting on the on that on that side of, of, of the market. Which is not too bad because the theory goes that if you don't overshoot, you, you don't really know what your limits are, and then you reach the you, you regroup, and then you continue growing again. But for you, just being scrappy, and last thing I'll say, I don't believe there's going to be a killer app. I think there might be many different small killer apps, and uh, focus on the th thin edges of the wedges instead of one killer app.